A very good evening for, to everyone from Singapore. My name is Benson Lim. I'm from Hogan Lovers Lee and Lee, and I'm also a member of the YSIAC committee. Today is the very first YSIAC event of the year, and as part of YSIAC's stable of annual events, the YSIC Club is a standalone uh, series that's focused on giving younger arbitration practitioners a voice on the panel and building thought leadership of tomorrow in arbitration. The topic chosen uh, is also substantive behavior and geared more towards issues of younger practitioners' thought leadership. Now, today, we talk about the functions and policies of decision making and investment arbitral awards. If you remember, the 2019 YSIC Club event was held in person, and I certainly hope to have more in-person events this year. But a virtual format allows us to bring in speakers from around the world. And so today, in our hybrid format of a presentation and a panel discussion, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Mary Mitzi, a lecturer at Queen Mary University of London, as our presentation speaker. Mary, a, a few words of introduction from you. Thank you, Benson, and thank you very much for the invitation. As Benson said initially, we were planning to uh, organize this event in person, but um, it's, it's again a great pleasure um, and excitement to see that we managed to uh, organize it uh, online at least. So thank you very much, Benson. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the invitation and the organization. So just a few words about me. Um, I am uh, Mary from Queen Mary, as I like to say. So I'm a lecturer in commercial law and I specialize in international arbitration. Uh, at Queen Mary, I, uh, I teach um, uh, investment arbitration, commercial arbitration, uh, and I also have the position of the director for executive education courses. Uh, we essentially, we contribute to the training of industry professionals delivering uh, training programs for practitioners, government officials, and, and even courts. Um, my experience with arbitral practice um, is um, in both civil and common law systems, and I have worked on international arbitration cases with LCIA, ICC, ICSID, and, and other arbitral institutions. Thank you, Benson. Thanks, Mary. So together with our presentation speaker, we have panel speakers today, and together we will seek to analyze the, the ways that arbitral tribunals reason their decisions and the use of precedents, customary law, general principles of law, and policy in the decision-making process. We will also touch upon the, is the issues of legitimacy, predictability, persuasion, and law development as functions of an arbitral tribunal's reasoning in its investment um, awards. Now, so together with me as part of the panel, kept Mr. Kevin Nash, uh, Director of uh, Registrar of SIAC, sends his apologies for not being able to attend, but we do have a very much stellar panel. Um, I first introduce uh, Ms. Samantha Tan, Senior Associate at Freshfields. Sam, some quick words of introduction. Hi, Benson. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, as Benson said, I'm a senior associate at Freshfields uh, based in Singapore. I've been practicing both commercial and investment treaty arbitration for a while. Um, I didn't begin my career in international law. I actually started as a general litigation and arbitration practitioner in Singapore. Um, I fell into the investment treaty field when I joined Freshfields. Uh, I've since had the privilege of working with and learning from some of the leading minds in this field. Uh, and together with my colleagues, we've been representing both investors and states in investment treaty arbitration. Uh, I found this to be a field full of very difficult questions. Um, and I understand that several of these difficult questions are going to be posed to us by Benson in the course of this evening. So I um, look forward to discussing them. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Samantha. Um, so to help her answer the difficult questions, we also have Ms. Jaehee Su, a senior associate at Allen Overy. Jaehee? Thank you, Benson, and thank you very much to you and YSIC for the invitation. As Benson said, I'm Jaehee, and I'm a senior associate at Allen & Overy. I specialize in investment treaty and international commercial arbitration, and as Samantha does, I represent both states and investors in investment arbitration. 
I really enjoy practicing investment treaty arbitration and I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to talk about the difficult but interesting issues with you all today. Just a quick summary of my trajectory. I'm originally from Korea, uh, but studied law and practiced law in England and Hong Kong. And I've been based in Singapore since um, around five years ago. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Jehi. And last on, on, but not least on our panel, we have uh, Mr. Lin Chunlong, a partner at Wong Partnership. Chunlong. Thank you, Benson. Thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, I'm Chun Long. I'm from Wong Partnership and I've been from the commercial and corporate disputes practice uh, based in Singapore uh, and also handling primarily litigation and arbitration work. Uh, look for, looking forward to the fruitful discussion on those difficult questions and 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 yes, I I, I can I think can start. Um, and so to conclude, I would simply say that we invite you as audience members to send us the geeky questions. Like I said, this is probably one of those sessions that you can completely geek out. And we would definitely encourage your participation from the audience. So without further ado, may I invite uh, Mary to give your presentation. Thank you, Benson. So if I, uh, if I can have the slides. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, this presentation uh, has its basis on uh, on the monograph that I published, uh, the decision making process of investor state arbitration tribunals. It was a long trajectory connected with my PhD, and here I will go through some main concepts and ideas um, and methodologies that I um, let's say came up with based on my research um, during my PhD. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Thank you. So uh, let me start with a question. Uh, what is decision-making and are there different types of decision-making, uh, especially in uh, investor state arbitration? Uh, as you may know, uh, for those of you at least who have experience in investor state arbitration, um, uh, Arbitration is a process of decision making, which is effectuated with connection to a specific dispute. It is connected to the ad hoc dispute settlement function of arbitral tribunals. So this is the direct function of arbitral tribunals, which is the resolution of a specific dispute. However, what is important is to identify the issues that are intertwined with such a function. Which are these issues? Such issues may be, for example, the ways national and international legal orders interact in the context of decision making, or the role of policy of customary international law, but also the role of third parties in the decision making process of investment arbitration tribunals. So uh, what we should keep in mind is that in a broad sense, investment arbitration tribunals are viewed as, let's say, instruments of the parties in the sense that uh, they provide uh, a dispute resolution service. But on the other hand, we should not forget that arbitrators are part of a value-based international community. Um, as such, arbitral decision-making can be explained through various uh, lenses that recognize the complex complexity of the arbitrator's decision-making. Uh, studies on decision making in arbitration largely borrow from judicial decision making. So um, essentially, uh, the genres that we can find in judicial decision making can be used to analyze arbitral decision making. The first genre under which decision making is uh, studied is the attitudinal or behavioral genre. So this genre postulates that uh, judges, in our case, arbitrators, decide not only in light of the facts of the case, but also based on ideological preferences. These studies were first introduced in the US and they focus on how the personal characteristics of the decision maker can influence the decision making process. And when I say personal characteristics, I mean, uh, elements such as uh, gender, race, education, religion, 
previous judicial experience, even political ideologies. So under the behavioral genre, we can study the decision-making process based on ideological preferences of arbitrators and how these preferences impact on arbitral outcomes. But the second genre under which we can study decision-making is the economic genre. So the economic model views arbitrators or judges as supporting the operation of successful social and economic systems. So the decision-making process under this genre is connected to mostly utilitarian concerns, such as money, income, power, prestige, or, or even reputation. Uh, the third genre of decision-making is the strategic plus institutional genre. Based on this approach, um, it is suggested that arbitrators are influenced by the choices of other actors, meaning of other arbitrators, or even by institutional settings. So there has been research on how arbitral institutions influence, may actually influence um, the decision making of arbitral tribunals. And when I say arbitral institutions, I mostly mean the institutional design, the broader institutional design of international arbitration. There is a fourth genre of arbitral decision making, which will be actually the focus of this presentation and was actually the focus of my monograph, which is the legal genre. Uh, the legal genre focuses on uh, the fact that arbitrators decide based on a reasoned analysis of the law. So essentially the decision making process is shaped by traditional principles of statutory interpretation. So I will focus on how arbitrators interpret and apply the law based on the legal genre of decision making. If we could please go to my next slide. Thank you. So let me start the analysis of the legal genre with a definition of legal reasoning. So what is legal reasoning? It's a concept that has been mentioned a lot, especially with regards to the legitimacy of the investment arbitration framework, which is the amount of reasoning that investment arbitration awards should include. But I want to make a step backwards and first try to define reasoning. So reasoning has been defined as the combination of intellectual tasks, which include the interpretation and selection of relevant facts, the identification of applicable legal rules, and essentially consideration of equities or other broader policies. Equities as you know is um, mostly a common law concept or other broader policies. So the intermediation of laws, facts and policies to reach an outcome can be all contained in an awards reasoning. Um, can we go to my next slide, please? With regard specifically to investment arbitration, what does the requirement to provide reasons entail in investment arbitration? The exit convention, uh, as well as the exit arbitration rules, do clearly refer to the reasoning of an award and the subsequent annulment of the award due to failure to state reasons. Um, specifically, Article 48.3 of the Convention states that the award should deal with every question submitted to the tribunal and state the reasons upon which it is based. Uh, as we said, failure to state the reasons on which the award is based constitutes a ground for annulment. Uh, as you can see, the requirement to provide reasons is uh, clearly stated. However, there is no clarity and precision as to the specific components of this requirement. So there are specific questions that, are, that arise due to this gap. Should the tribunals address in their reasoning all the arguments, pieces of evidence and authorities in the record? Um, it, it, this is not, this is not uh, an easy question and there is no clear cut reply. From a quantity perspective, when it comes to the issue of whether the tribunals should address 
um, all the arguments of the parties, the Enron ad hoc committee uh, observed that, and I quote, a tribunal has a duty to deal with each of the questions submitted to it, but is not required to comment on all arguments of the parties in relation to each of those questions. So based on this way of thinking, uh, the decision of the tribunal cannot be annulled on the basis that the tribunal could have provided a more detailed evaluation of the facts or the legal issue or the legal issues raised by the parties. Let's continue with the second question. Can the arbitrator base the awards reasoning on elements the parties did not refer to, such as authorities deriving from, uh, from case law? Again, a complicated question. Um, and uh, there are some answers from arbitral tribunals. For example, the uh, tribunal in the Glamis case makes reference to such a scenario, stating that um, in terms of its case-specific mandate, a tribunal should decide the matter before it on the basis of the authorities submitted to it and to the degree that the parties to the dispute do not raise an authority to the attention, to, sorry, do not raise what the tribunal regards to be a particularly relevant authority, the tribunal should bring such authority to the attention of the parties and provide them with the opportunity to comment. So based on the Glamis Tribunal, the tribunal can bring an authority to the attention of the parties and should give the parties the opportunity to comment on, um, on that case. Um, can we continue with my next slide, please? Thank you. So um, which are the functions of reasoning? Until now, we saw that the reasoning requirement is there, it exists, arbitral awards should be reasoned, but the exact content of reasoning or the exact extent of reasoning depends on uh, how each arbitral tribunal views this uh, reasoning requirement. Which are the functions of reasoning? Um, in investment arbitration, the functions of reasoning are very closely connected to the specific features of investor state arbitration. Uh, such as public policy interests, we have a state involved in the dispute, uh, and also the need to provide a legitimate private decision-making process. The first uh, function of reasoning uh, is acceptability. The reasoning of an award plays a very important role in externalizing the decision-making process followed. So through reasoning, the decision maker translates, let's say, the legal decision making process into a language that opens up the way for its acceptability by specific audiences. And I will come back to the issue of specific audiences further down. So in general terms, acceptability can be achieved by understanding. And we all know that understanding in its turn can be achieved through uh, arguing through um, asking for explanations, going back, back and forth, uh, ultimately everything that helps you understand an argument. But uh, an arbitral award, as you can understand, does not give you the possibility to engage into a discussion. Therefore, in investment arbitration, the arbitral award's acceptability depends on the level of its persuasion. Has the arbitral tribunal with its reasoning persuaded the audience that uh, this, is, um, this is a justified decision? So as we can see here, persuasion is strongly connected to acceptability when it comes to investment arbitration and the reasoning of an investment arbitration award. So which is the audience that has to be persuaded, that will be persuaded or will not be persuaded? In investment arbitration, there are two types of audiences, the internal audience and the external audience. As you can easily understand, when we talk about the internal audience, uh, we talk about the actual parties, the parts to the specific dispute. The reasoning of an award primarily 
has the uh, function of explaining to parties uh, of the specific dispute why they have won or lost. Um, so which is the external audience? Reasoning, especially of investment arbitration awards, may affect external recipients. And when I say affect, I use this word in broader terms. Um, when I say external recipients, on the other hand, I mean everyone who will read the award one, once it is published. So this audience may include uh, decision makers for of future disputes, arbitrators that want to be guided by the award, um, future parties that may use the award in order to understand how a specific arbitrator decides, and even NGOs, um, uh, so social uh, and other legal audiences that uh, may use these awards in order to, let's say, submit a, a make courier submissions for other cases. Um, can we go forward to my next slide? Thank you. So the second function of reasoning after acceptability, which is also connected to acceptability, is legitimacy. Uh, why do we need legitimacy in investment arbitration? Why is it not a given that investment arbitration um, uh, promotes a legitimizing function and is a legitimate decision-making process? The concerns that have come up to date is that in the investment arbitration field, there is the image of a decentralized and non-hierarchical dispute resolution framework, that it's a private structure of dispute resolution that does not uh, really have the safeguards of a state judicial system. And uh, this has led to legitimacy concerns from both external and internal audiences. Uh, so what is the function of, uh, of an awards reasoning? Does the awards reasoning have a legitimizing function? Uh, going a bit more uh, into um, the, the, the nature of an international uh, adjudicative body legitimacy, this leg legitimacy depends on the perceived justification of its authority. And how does an arbitral decision-making process justify its authority? Uh, such justificatory factors may include, for example, perceptions of fairness and impartiality, um, democratic norms, transparency, but also consistent interpretation and application of the norms. So consistency in interpreting and applying the norms constitutes a legitimizing function of the dispute resolution process. Uh, since investment arbitration awards reasoning expresses and externalizes such a process of interpretation and application, it does have the, um, it, it does have the dynamic of uh, offering a legitimizing element to the investment arbitration system as far as it also promotes consistency and predictability. Uh, next slide, please. The third function of the awards reasoning is law development. Uh, the process of uh, interpretation um, is very important in what we call the development of, of the law. So 30 years ago, Professor Carboneau was the one that dealt with the issue of rendering arbitral awards with reasons. And he did highlight the fact that this could contribute to the development of a common law of international transactions. In investment arbitration, the task of the tribunal is to decide uh, a specific dispute, but has very wide discretion. It has wide discretion because of the general wording of the investment treaties. This in its turn, gives leeway to arbitral tribunals to develop the law, develop the treaty language through arbitral decisions. So um, awards accompanied by reasons do constitute an appropriate means for fulfilling the normative potential of transnational arbitration 
and slowly but steadily contribute to the development of a transnational law. And when I say transnational law, I mean transnational investment arbitration law. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, concluding with the functions of reasoning, uh, we just saw now that uh, the reasoning of arbitral awards is a very important element when it comes to decision making. Um, but let me continue now with more specific elements with regards to interpretation and application of the law. How do arbitrators interpret the law in investment arbitration disputes? How do they do that? Let me start with the most obvious reply that may come to mind, the Vienna Convention. As we, know, as we know, the Vienna Convention constitutes the main point of reference when decision makers interpret international treaties. We have Article 31, which um, provides for the main interpretive principles when it comes to treaty interpretation. Just a caveat here. Um, in practice, arbitral tribunals, of course, do recognize the importance of the Vienna Convention, um, but the process described in the Vienna Convention is not always followed step by step. There is also another view uh, based on which Article 31 should be viewed as one integrated rule rather than a number of rules to be applied um, in sequence. So um, now I come to my next question, to my next question, which is, why do arbitrators use the Vienna Convention interpretive principles to, um, to interpret investment treaties? The Vienna Convention interpretive, interpretive principles is the traditional public international law um, uh, treaty for interpreting um, international uh, treaties. So it is a source of guidance for arbitral tribunals. It does build their credibility when exercising their decision-making function. Um, and they do enhance the legitimacy of the awards. How? By rooting an interpretation process in the long tradition of public international law, which is provided by the Vienna Convention. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, but there is a question that arises and that, um, that it's not difficult to understand whilst going through the case law of investment arbitration awards. And the question is, is uh, the Vienna Convention interpretive law principles, are they effective? Are they enough um, to, um, to respond to the interpretive needs of uh, investment arbitration awards? Um, in the investment arbitration framework, we should not forget that apart from the states, um, the, uh, the appearance of a private investor may bring to the fore the need to respond to a balancing process, a balancing process between the public interest of the state and the needs of, of the investor, the protection of the investor, the confidentiality maybe that the investor requires. So um, the Vienna Convention-based arguments uh, are very useful to interpret treaties, but what happens when uh, other interpretive tasks may arise? For example, the need to interpret precedents, the need to refer to precedent, the need to use customer international law, the need to interpret general principles of law, the need to take into consideration policies, all these issues that may arise in the investment arbitration framework. How can the Vienna Convention help us interpret all these, um, all these uh, interpretive needs? Uh, based on this question, uh, what, what, uh, what will help us um, understand how arbitrators decide is to propose a, a new methodology of decision-making, a new methodology of interpretation, which of course includes analysis of the Vienna Convention, but is not limited to the Vienna Convention. And this is the, uh, and this is the content of the dialogical network approach, the transnational dialogue approach, which is that arbitrators do not restrict themselves 
to themselves to the Vienna Convention, but they use general principles of law, policies, customary international law, and precedent in order to meet the interpretive needs that arise in practice. Uh, my next slide, please. Thank you. So I mentioned that arbitrators, apart from the Vienna Convention, refer to precedent, use uh, and make references to other arbitral awards in order to fill in the gaps of the Vienna Convention and in order to acquire guidance in how to interpret concepts such as who is an investor, what is an investment, um, how do we accord fair and equitable treatment? How do we ensure that there is no discrimination? So uh, through their citations practices, we can see that arbitral tribunals have formed dialogues with various international judicial bodies and not only with other arbitral tribunals. In essence, apart from citing uh, the case law of investment arbitration tribunals, they also cite the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, for example. To give you an illustration, the Mondov Tribunal examined the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights when interpreting the minimum standard of treatment and whether the right to a court um, is connected to the minimum standard of treatment. So the Mondov Tribunal mentioned that it referred to the ECHR jurisprudence in order to acquire guidance by analogy. So precedent is the first, um, the first trace of dialogue between arbitral tribunals, but also between arbitral tribunals and international and even national legal orders. When I say national legal orders, an example that may come to mind is legitimate expectations. Legitimate expectations used now in the context of expropriation in investment arbitration was imported from domestic law systems, which was a concept created in, a constitutional, in the constitutional sphere of domestic law systems and was imported into uh, investment arbitration. If we can continue with my next slide, please. Customary international law um, is, uh, is the second part of, uh, actually the third part of the interpretation process of um, investment arbitration tribunals. Let's not forget that investment arbitration evolved from its customary law origins in order to regulate uh, foreign investments and balance the interest of uh, the rights of the investor and, uh, and the state. Certain investment treaties make direct reference to the customary international law standards of protection. For example, the uh, US Rwanda BIT, specifically Article 5, links the minimum standard of treatment including fair and equitable treatment with the customary international law minimum standard of treatment of aliens. However, what should be kept in mind is that um, practice of international tribunals reveals that even though treaties make reference to the customary international law standard, um, tribunals tend to uh, proceed to an evolutionary interpretation of customary international law. So they may take the customer, the, the customary international law standard a step further and adapt it to the uh, investment arbitration framework. An example um, is the uh, Pope and Talbot Award. Even though there was an interpretation and note from uh, the NAFTA uh, Trade Commission, the Pope and Dalpot uh, Award on Damages went a step further and did not exactly connect the uh, fair and equitable treatment with the customary international law standard, but mentioned that even that customary international law standard evolves through state practice and its interpretation should depend on how it evolved through state practice and not on the fact that it's stable through time. So even though arbitral tribunals make reference to customary international law, they do uh, proceed to an evolutionary interpretation of, of this standard, essentially how this standard evolved through practice. 
Next slide, please. Another element of decision making is the use of uh, general principles of law. Arbitral tribunals do resort to general principles of law, essentially uh, in order to uh, fill in the gaps of the treaties and uh, as, a, as, an, uh, as, an, uh, as a way to um, aid in the interpretation of the vague protection guarantees. An example of uh, such principles include Pacta Sunt Servanda, unjust enrichment, arrest judicata. In investment arbitration, a stark illustration of general principle of law, which has been used, but also has acquired a specialized content, a content in investment arbitration is the principle of good faith. The principle of good faith uh, has been used extensively in investment arbitration, uh, prescribing that um, it is prohibited to exercise a right in a way that could uh, cause malicious damage to someone else. Uh, an example is the Mali Court Tribunal, which has used uh, the principle of good faith um, in the context of the interpretation of the fair and equitable treat, uh, treatment standard. So um, in this respect, although general principles of law traditionally arise uh, out of the comparative analysis of domestic laws, when it comes to this arbitral decision making, uh, arbitral tribunals tend to use the general principles of laws of laws and adapt them to the specific interpretational needs of investment arbitration. Uh, as I said, my example of using uh, good faith uh, in the context of interpreting fair and equitable treatment. And next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, another element that can be traced in the legal decision-making process of uh, investment arbitration tribunals are policies. Policies initially was, let's say, a taboo issue. So um, policies were there, they were not discussed because um, it, it may have been thought that policies take away arbitral tribunals from their case-specific mandate. They're mandated to decide on a specific dispute. Um, however, uh, policy-based arguments do bring arbitral decision-making in contact with its reality. We cannot theorize over interpretation without contemplating uh, the policies that shape the reality of investment arbitration. There are different types of policies. There are policies directly expressed in investment treaties, which are the economic policies and political policies, and I will speak about them in a while. But there are also policies that are not clearly expressed in investment treaties, but have been expressed by arbitral tribunals in practice. And these are mostly legal policies and uh, social policies, even though nowadays social policies do increasingly make an appearance in uh, the treaties themselves. Let me start with political policies. What are these political policies? Um, uh, investment treaties were initially viewed as uh, an act of uh, political cooperation between states. Um, this is clearly illustrated, for example, in the reasoning of the Banro Tribunal, um, noting that one of the main objectives of the Washington Convention is to deal with the international tension uh, resulted when using the uh, when using diplomatic protection. Another political objective is the creation and strengthening of uh, relationships and cooperation between uh, two countries. Uh, so these are the evident, uh, the evident political uh, policies based on which uh, treaties were created. And a second policy which is very closely connected to that is an economic policy, which is a rather evident policy. Uh, uh, the creation of um, a framework that uh, promotes international cooperation for economic development and the, uh, the um, aim to attract foreign direct investments in countries 
was one of the main aims of treaties and investment treaties and the protection of the investor. Last, uh, so continuing actually with the, the third uh, type of policies, the legal policies. Legal policies, as I said, are policies that do not appear directly in investment treaties, but uh, derive from the case law of arbitral tribunals. Examples of these policies, consistency in interpretation, certainty, predictability, transparency, all these policies connected with how arbitrators decide whether they consistently apply the law, whether they consistently interpret the law, are legal policies. Um, we can find in the reasoning of investment arbitration awards, an example is the Suez case, where the tribunal clearly re refers to the importance of establishing a predictable, stable, stable sorry, legal framework for the investment. So all these legal policies gradually appear in the decision-making process of arbitrators and, uh, and uh, may constitute the basis for uh, a specific interpretation in, in the reasoning of the arbitral award. Last but not least, emerging social policy concerns. Uh, ESG issues, environmental social governance issues, have been the hot talk of every legal field uh, and uh, rightly so of investment arbitration as well. A few preamble of investment treaties do refer to sustainable development, but uh, slowly and steadily social policy concerns, environmental concerns do make their appearance in the reasoning of investment arbitration awards. And also let's not forget Amicus Curia submissions civil society through think, tank, think tanks, lobby groups, NGOs, play a very important role in the emergence of social policy concerns. So policy con uh, social policy concerns, environmental rights, sustainable development have made the gradual appearance in not only the decision-making of arbitral tribunals, but also in investment treaties. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm wrapping up. So this is my, um, my final slide. Um, we discussed uh, until now about the law development, uh, acceptability. We continued with how arbitral tribunals decide, uh, which is the, uh, which are the uh, interpretation arguments that they use? How do they interpret uh, an award? And uh, based on all this um, research on how arbitral tribunals decide, um, it is interesting that uh, arbitral tribunals have gradually developed a transnational decision-making process. What does that mean? So um, that the transnational characteristics of investment arbitration constituting the fact that um, investment arbitration uh, is a framework that um, where not only private parties interact with states, but also, as we said, NGOs, international organizations, uh, public interests, private interests, and also investment arbitration lies at the intersection of many fields of public international law, of private law. So all these fields interact in the investment arbitration framework. So the first characteristic of this transnational process is that it's non-traditional. As we said, investment arbitration, investment, investment arbitrators do use the traditional interpretation path of the Vienna Convention, but they go a step further in using precedent policies and other means in order to fill the conventional gaps. Another characteristic, characteristic of transnational decision-making, it's non-statist. We have seen until now that the state is not the only actor in investment arbitration. The private investor is an actor. Uh, international arbitral institutions are actors. Ancestral is an actor. NGOs are actors. So um, the uh, non-state's characteristic of investment arbitration has revealed that the state is not the main uh, actor of the field. Uh, 
continuing with the third characteristic, normative decision making. Uh, we noticed that um, the reasoning of investment arbitration awards can help develop the context of vague protection guarantees and through consistent application, they do have a normative, um, uh, they do have a normative function in the investment arbitration scene. Finally, decision making in investment arbitration is a dynamic process. It's formed and transformed through the practice of arbitral tribunals and the dialogue between investment arbitration tribunals, but also amongst them and national and international legal orders um, shows again that uh, transnational decision making in arbitration is a dynamic process. So uh, to conclude, uh, the gradual development of a transnational decision making process has created the broader picture of a dispute resolution process, progressively acquiring its own special place in, in the legal, um, in the legal uh, systems. And uh, it has developed based on its own specific specificities, but it still creates communication channels with international and national legal orders. Thank you. Many thanks, Perry, for the very deep dive into this topic. Um, and so now is a good time uh, to have the entire panel with me. Uh, there are a few topics I would like to discuss um, arising from Mary's uh, presentation. Uh, but I would like also to invite our guests uh, to feel free to use the Q&A box uh, to type in your questions and incorporate them. Now, so to all the panelists, I think one of the topics that was, uh, was raised in Mary's presentation was about the legal framework that is used by different uh, investment arbitral tribunals. And there was also some comparison about the various um, investment rules on the requirement to provide reasons. So taking on from that, do you think that greater normative uniformity of transparency frameworks across all the investment arbitration rules, including the SIAC investment rules, uh, is something of a boon or being? Uh, anyone from the panel? Yeah, hi, Vincent. I'm happy to jump in. Um, I'll start with an overview of what we mean by transparency frameworks, but I'm not going to describe them in detail in the light of the time constraints. Um, in general, if you look at the arbitration rules governing investment treaty arbitration, all of them require arbitrators to give reasons for their awards unless the parties agree that reasoning is not required. Then there is also um, generally provision in all of these rules that requires some form of publication of um, excerpts of decisions. So for the award, for example, one of the things we discussed is that it's important for arbitrators' decisions to be consistent. And it's for that reason, I think, that many of these rules require publication of at least redacted excerpts of decisions. Now, there's a sliding scale, and I think this is what Benson is getting at when he talks about uh, greater uniformity. There's a sliding scale of the degree of transparency required by each of the rules. On the most extreme end of most publication, most transparency, we have the UNCITRA rules. And then the SIEC investment rules and the old exit or the existing exit rules are kind of around the same. They require party consent for the, product, uh, the publication of awards in full, as well as any other documents from the arbitration. Now, ICSID has now proposed some amendments to boost its transparency somewhat closer up to the UNCITRA rule, where there's almost default publication of full awards. There's a period where parties will be deemed to have consented to the publication. Um, so I hope that gives everyone a, a big overview of the transparency frameworks we're talking about. And to answer the question, is a greater uniformity of these frameworks something of a boon or a bane? Is it good or bad? I think as a matter of principle and at some level of abstraction, greater uniformity is favorable in theory. Having the same level of detail um, available for all the awards that are published, regardless of the institution that administers the arbitration, would be favorable for developing a consistent jurisprudence. So you can compare and contrast. The caveat is, as counsel representing clients on both investor and state sides, 
I have to put myself in the client's shoes and consider their particular concerns, as well as the particular treaties or instruments with which we are concerned. So there tends in reality, I think, to be a bit of a mismatch between the theory of what's most favorable for ensuring the development of the investment treaty jurisprudence uh, and the peculiar sensitivities that must arise in the real world situation where a state is considering how much information from an arbitration has to be published. Uh, if I may give some views on, on this issue, uh, I do agree with uh, Samantha that uh, the increasing uh, uniformity in the transparency framework is generally a favorable development. And, and before I go to that, if I may just uh, put it in these terms, I think the increasing uniformity also represents um, there's increasing consensus on the balance between, on the one hand, uh, we have confidentiality and privacy, uh, which are important qualities uh, traditionally associated with arbitrations. And on the other hand, we need to have transparency because ultimately when we talk about investor state arbitrations, we are looking at public interest and that decision can could affect millions. So I think that's the context that we are looking at. And I think one, one particular reason why I think it's an, advan uh, it's an advantage for increasing uniformity is because when, when, when we see that tri uh, tribunals are called upon to actually implement or deal with transparency-related issues, uh, the fact that there is some uniformity also allows them to draw from the experience and, and decisions of other tribunals when they deal with similar issues. For example, we have uh, questions of whether a non-party has sufficient interest to participate in the, in the proceedings. And these are some common things that we see in the rules these days when we look at the institutional rules as well as the proposed amendments to the exit rules. So that, that's so when, when we and I think the uniformity, increasing uniformity would definitely um improve that aspect, help decision making. Uh, in, in that respect. So, so that's that's my view on the issue. Jay, comments? Um, not much to add there, I must say. I think the other speakers have covered it all. The only thing I would say is I do believe that any uniform framework that's adopted would need to have sufficient flexibility. And I think Samantha was kind of touching on this point when you were talking about reality versus theory. I think the this means that the framework should have sufficient safeguards as to reduction, for example, and should also allow tribunals to take into account the fact that the case for transparency does not apply equally to every case and to every document. For example, I think it's fair to say, and there is quite a consensus on the point that it is helpful to have the tribunal's reasoning either in the form of words or decisions published to help develop consistent law. However, the case for transparency, I would say, is perhaps less compelling for submissions, particularly where an arbitration is ongoing. There may be a risk of public pressure on the respondent states, for example. So I would say, yes, it's a boon, but provided that there is sufficient flexibility that's built into it. And, and just a... Uh... And I just want to touch briefly on the SIF investment arbitration rules. So, just any brief comments from the panel as to what do you think of the transparency framework? Short one liner. I think it strikes a good balance. That's a short one liner. That's a pretty good <laughs> one liner. Uh, so, looking at the, the audience, uh, we have uh, largely from, from the Asia. So, I, I'm going to now move a little bit further to talk about investment treaties, uh, these uh, new investment treaties in Asia. And I would like to ask the panel, and Mary, feel free to jump in. Um, and do, do you see any drafting trends, a treaty drafting trend, where state parties are now opting for clear language to avoid inconsistency in interpretation by tribunals? Do, do you see that? I mean, what, what is the general trend? I'm, I'm happy to make a start on that, perhaps. I do see that there is a trend of state parties essentially using treaty drafting as a tool for avoiding or at least reducing the risk of inconsistency in interpretation. And I think in this part of the world, perhaps India's model BIT in 2016 was seen as many as sort of signifying the start of this trend. But there are more recent examples like the CPTPP, Indonesia, Singapore, BIT, etc. 
I mean, in the interest of time, I wouldn't go into all the details, but I just wanted to point out what I find particularly interesting or, or to be more common in, in these days. And one way in which states use drafting to avoid in inconsistency is by cutting down on the most popular standard in investment treaty arbitration, which is the FET standard. I mean, you could do that by expressly qualifying it by reference to the minimum CIL standard or by carving out legitimate expectations altogether from its ambit, which model BIT, the India model BIT appears to do. And the other one other interesting way in which states do this is by incorporating some case law expressly into the treaty. So for example, in the India model BIT, the definition of investment adopts something quite like the Salini criteria expressly. So by doing this, it does bring more certainty. And I think from a practitioner's perspective, it does mean that we could reduce the number of caveats in our advice to clients. But it is also true that some investors may perceive these changes as cutting back on the rights that existed previously. I think the the interesting thing, if I might, if I may jump in, the interesting thing is that a lot of this increased clarity of language, including the citation of case law, evolved because the original unclear broad drafting was tested in decisions um, and decided one way or another with some reasoning, and that it was that reasoning that was adopted to clarify the newer treaties. So it's a little bit. Um, circular, in a sense, I think the Asian state parties trying to um, create more certainty and have more control over the interpretation of their treaties, but at the same time, getting to that increased certainty kind of depends on the language being tested and interpreted by tribunals. Um, I just want to add one other point. There's another way I think you think about it. Uh, states could have more control over consistency. And Mary mentioned this when she talked about the Pope and Talbot decision. You have the US, Mexico, and Canada joint commission approach where they issue interpretive notes from time to time um, that set out principles for the interpretation of the trilateral treaty. Uh, and these interpretive notes are binding. So that's another way that Asian states have not adopted yet, but maybe in the future might be an option. I, I, I just want to add that I, I agree with that, Sam, and I think, in fact, the CPTPP has something similar, maybe not quite identical, but essentially a commission of states that can issue binding dec decisions on interpretation. So maybe that is adding to the trends here as well. That's a good point, yeah. Hello, anything to add? Um, I think one observation uh, for ASEAN treaties is that how they define covered investments and I think what they try to do is to limit it to subject it to the member states domestic law, administrative rules and regulations. And I think that's uh, quite an interesting development because I think that is intended to sort of um, make it quite clear that as long as the, cover, the investment in question doesn't follow the, doesn't conform local laws and, and the tribunal doesn't even need to engage in the process of considering whether or not the breach is de minimis, which are, which are processes that they might have to take if, if there is, uh, such a, a definition is, doesn't exist. But of course, the concern is that whether or not um, that could be used uh, in some ways to, to sort of deprive investors from, from protection under the various treaties. And that's a concern that has been raised. So just wanted to flag this uh, observation on, on this particular aspect. Yeah, so just to pick up a point, you're talking about local, and this is probably a good time. We are running short of time, but I will pick one question. And um, so there's one question from the audience talking about local law. So, so many ISDS um, arbitrations are seated in the country when they are not, is it, uh, if a tribunal in one of those cases seeks to base its decision making on idioms or notions outside what can be described as established rules of PIL, then would it be rendering uh, an award that's more likely to be cha successfully challenged in the courts of the seat? Uh, Mary, any comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Benson, and thank you for the question. It's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, we should start by the premises that arbitral tribunals are there to resolve a specific dispute. Um, and, um, and first of all, the submissions of the parties should be the starting point of arbitral tribunals. 
Um, then it depends on, on uh, the systemic approach of each tribunal. As I mentioned, the Glamis Award, the tribunal there referred to the possibility of the tribunal introducing um, a case that the parties had not referred to, but gave the both of the parties the opportunity to present the case. So uh, it, it may seem irrelevant uh, at the beginning, but uh, we should uh, take into consideration that uh, whatever the tribunal decides to do should ensure that the due process and the right of the parties to be heard is respected. So the case of the Klamis Tribunal uh, making reference to a decision that was not um, that was not mentioned by the parties, uh, and in order to um, in order to um, uh, to respect the due process, gave the opportunity to the parties to comment on that. That is the best way to go, uh, and showing respect to due process and uh, and the rights of the parties to be heard. Thanks, Mary. So we have time for one last question, and I want to pick on one issue that uh, Mary. Um, put it out in her presentation, and that is the difference of uh, the VCLT interpretive approach and the dialogical ne uh, network approach. So as a concluding question for the panel, um, what is your view on the effectiveness of the VCLT interpretation in investment arbitration? Do you agree with the views that uh, Mary uh, just presented a while ago? So let's just go around the table and uh, sum up this discussion. Too long, maybe you start first. Well, I think uh, the VCLT is definitely quite a useful tool in uh, aiding interpretation of the treaties. Of course, the, the question then is, there is a difference when uh, when tribunals try to apply the, the VCLT to, to the interpretive questions. And I think that that is, and because different tribunals may just uh, apply differently. And the, the I think the key issue is, the drawing on experience from different uh, different case, uh, that that whole wealth of uh, body of decisions and all that, and I think that would help uh, uh, towards creating some form of consistency in, in the way that is being applied. Um, when I look at Article thirty two, and we also see that you no, know, there is a reference to supplementary means of interpretation, and one of the items that materials there is preparatory work of the treaty. Um, and that that particular uh uh material, I think that has uh, gave, gave us some kind of concern because when we looked at uh, negotiating uh, materials containing negotiations and all that, whether that presents a fair view or an uh, objective view of what uh, the, those discussions were and, all, and whether there's a complete record of all these negotiations. So I think these are some issues associated with the VCLT. I have a few comments on that. Um, picking up on the preparatory work point that Chun Dong mentioned, one difficulty sometimes faced is that the travel of treaties of some states are actually not public. They are confidential, they are official secrets. And so sometimes you have difficulty or the tribunal might have difficulty in interpreting um, a treaty because the travel is simply not available. Of course, I think, if, if the state is involved, there might be discovery applications by which that might be produced and confidentiality provisions to protect the confidentiality of those documents. But that's sometimes an issue, especially if you're not in the midst of an arbitration proceeding. Um, the other thing that I would add on the VCLT is a threshold point first. I don't know if any of you have read um, Mary's book, but she did something really interesting and I think valuable. She interviewed some arbitrators and she has quotes or descriptions of what those arbitrators said appropriately on anonymized, of course. And one arbitrator said, the Vienna Convention is a set of principles rather than tools. And I think that just brings the Vienna Convention as a, an analog to what we have in English common law contractual interpretation. The principles set out in investors, compensation scheme, for example, are also principles and not rules. And so I think they are useful to that extent and you can think of them in the same way that we think about the interpretive principles set out in the English common law. Hey. Yes, I, I don't have too much to add to but there, but I would say that in the field that's 
controversial as investment arbitration, where a consensus on any point is difficult to find, it is still helpful to, and I think we all agree to have BCLT, because it does represent a common ground. But I thoroughly agree with Mary that in practice, BCLT is not a straight road to answers. In fact, it merely represents a starting point. And in practice, the arbitral decision making goes a few steps further. And that means that from a practitioner's perspective, BCLT is a constant ingredient in your advice, in your submissions, but most of your pages would be devoted to analyzing case law, exploring arguments based on policy and customer international law, etc. So I think it is helpful when BCLT does not give answers for the tribunal to be clear on that and explain specifically what other arguments are relying on then to make the decision. And Mary's dialogical approach, I think, is really helpful because it does help close the gap between the theory and practice and provides a framework not just for the tribunals who are writing the award, but, but for those of us who are analyzing and reading the award to apply, to try to find the route, if you like, from point A to the conclusion at point B. So that's all I wanted to say on that. Well, with that, I also have to conclude the seminar uh, with thanks um, to Mary for joining us and presenting on this uh, quite an interesting topic and approaches that she's advocating in her book. You're welcome, obviously, to look at the book in closer detail. I also take this opportunity to thank our panelists for joining me today um, in this discussion, as well as SICBD team. And more importantly, uh, for the rest of the year, please do join us for future YSIC events. Sign up as a member. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.